Cool. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Today we're super excited to present the topic five common code patterns that slow down your app. In this webinar, we'll explore prevalent challenges faced by app developers in delivering an exceptional mobile user experience. Uh, to, examples we share today will be both applicable to iOS and Android. However, since we do have a special guest here today who is highly experienced in Android development, we will have a slight focus on Android. But if you're interested in iOS only webinar, no worries, just let us know by dropping a comment and we'll be more than happy to arrange it. Our goal today is to provide you with valuable insights that will empower you to recognize these code patterns on your own or collaborate with us to achieve your performance goals more effectively. A bit of housekeeping uh, before we start, the duration of the section is set for 45 minutes, which will include uh, some time for Q&A at the end. Feel free to ask your questions throughout the whole webinar by sending me a direct message or posting it in the group chat. If we, uh, by any chance, we can uh, answer all the questions, we'll be sure to follow up with you. And furthermore, a recording of this webinar will be made available on our website next week. Without further ado, let's dive into the content and get started. So first of all, we'd like to say hi. Today, we're thrilled to have Anastasia who have two years of experience in solving um, different kind of performance challenges for different mobile apps. We also have Brian here who is a Android development veteran of 13 years, also here to answer any questions you have for Android. And I'm Scarlett, your facilitator, who have been building product um, for mobile app developers, previously uh, Fire, uh, Fire Advertising, now Fire Performance uh, Enhancement to help you drive revenue. And we're all part of this uh, product science team. We're a passionate team of professionals uh, who were united by the same goal that is to amplify user delight. Fire first, del deliver exceptional mobile user experience for users like you and me. We want to empower engineers to uh, with performance engineering insights and tools, because let's be honest, performance can be a bit overwhelming. And last but not least, we want to democratize performance engineering for everyone's contribution. So let's create some seamless and delightful mobile user experience together. Now you may be wondering, why are we so devoted to performance? Well, because we have all experienced its impact firsthand. Picture this, you're hungry and decide to order food through a food delivery app. But alas, it's taken forever too long for you to place an order, leaving you hungry and frustrated. Well, in a world filled with so many like app options, you swiftly switch to another app that lets you place the order quickly, delivers quickly, and satisfies your need. From that moment on, you become a loyal customer to this fast app, while the first one leaves you a really bad, bad impression. This personal experience shows us how crucial app performance is for user satisfaction and loyalty. Not yet convinced by this experience, let's take a look at some data. According to AppSlyer, a marketing and uh, analytic platform for mobile, nearly half of all apps are installed within the first 30 days. And Andrew Chan, who is a tech newsletter writer, investor for startup, his study also suggests that losing 80% of mobile users is common, especially for those uh, like apps, popular apps. App abandonment is often due to a bad experience, especially uh, slow performance and unreliability. Um, a study by Think Storage News report actually reviewed that 70% of mobile app users will abandon an app if it takes too long to load. An older but often still cited report by Computer study found that 84% will abandon an app after just two failures. In this competitive market, mobile app developer must prioritize continuous availability and a seamless user experience to reduce churn. Unlike web applications, mobile users expect instant response to the tap, to the swipe, or any inputs. And to, in order to ensure a consistently great user experience, a continuously monitoring and enhancing your app performance is of paramount importance. Um, in order to retain user and succeed in this highly competitive mobile app landscape. So today we're super excited to present the solution that we have entirely working on. Um, <clears throat> And don't worry, this is uh, the most we'll talk about product today because it's not a focus. 
Um, but our product mainly comprise two main part. Uh, so the first is our cutting edge instrumentation, which automatically identifies an instrument only what matters. Once you got that setup done, basically you can effortlessly, effortlessly gain performance inside in just two simple steps without tool. So that's all today. <laughs> We're going to talk about product. But if you'd like to learn more and talk more about it, I'm more than happy to uh, show you around and hear your valuable feedback for our product. Um, and with that, let's part is, pass it to Anastasia. Hey, sorry for this uh, tiny technical issue with the sound. Uh, thank you, Scarlett, for the great introduction. Um, and let me introduce the main topic, the main scope of today's webinar. Uh, so at Product Science, we have large experience optimizing mobile apps across different platforms and industries. And throughout this experience, uh, we see that most common reasons for apps to slow down, to have any kinds of delays, they repeat each other from app to app, regardless of the platform language it's written on or any other parameters. So today we're going to cover five code patterns and one bonus category as well that are most commonly to cause the delays. And we find them not only most common, but also most impactful and what's especially important also actionable. So uh, you can actually not only find them, but fix them and make significant improvements in your apps, make them uh, run faster. So without further ado, let's dive into those five topics. Uh, now, the first pattern that we're going to look into, and actually the first two, they're kind of, they fall in the same scope. They would be about queuing, and the first one would be waiting, wasting some time in unrecognized queues. So the idea behind this category and one, why it is one of the most common is that um, when you're designing a mobile app and you're trying to implement some feature or page, you actually have can have multiple processes running in your app and you'll be utilizing multiple threads to run those processes in parallel. So even if the process that you're designing, if the page opening or any other feature that you're implementing is designed efficiently, if the process is fine by itself and you're scheduling things to run on multiple threads, you're still inevitably going to uh, experience some bottlenecks when you're scheduling something to execute on a parallel thread, like in this example here. But then instead of the function that you're scheduling to implement uh, to execute on a parallel thread would only run after a certain delay. And that delay will not be due to the process that it is a part of, but you, due to some unrelated stuff going on and blocking the thread that it's trying to execute on. So it is most common to happen on the main thread because main thread is a natural bottleneck and there is a lot of stuff that can only be uh, executed there. However, it also happens in other dedicated threads uh, for any particular pur uh, purpose, such as any local database updates, but there are many more examples. And uh, with this, I'll pass uh, stage to Brian to give his insights from engineering point of view and dive deeper into more particular examples of when it is common to happen. Thanks, Anastasia. That's a great description you gave of unrecognized cues. And let's try to add a little bit of concreteness to it uh, with some examples. Um, a big problem uh, or big reason that we have unrecognized cues is that a lot of times it's an implementation detail of a library or other dependency that we're using. Um, for example, in this diagram, we're showing uh, behavior of a very popular OK HTTP library, uh, which is not only used a lot, but it's also um, a dependency of lots of popular uh, other popular networking libraries, and even in um, some video streaming applications like or, or libraries like ExoPlayer. So in this example, we have uh, something happening on the main thread, say a button push or other user interaction, 
uh, and it wants to trigger a network request. Well, on OKHTTP, OK the default dispatcher, uh, this isn't really that widely known, but it has a limit of five concurrent network requests. So uh, if you have five network requests going on when uh, you try to launch your network request, it will have to wait for one of those five network requests to complete. So we're showing here in the diagram that thread number two completes its network request. And then finally, our network request, which is a sixth network request, uh, can be added um, uh, in, in another thread to uh, to retrieve some data. And this isn't just a, a specific, an example that's specific to OKHTP. Um, there are lots of other uh, places where it can, occur, it can occur, such as in the room database, uh, where you can only do one transaction at a time. Um, and then there are also cases where we make sort of a coding. Um, maybe we're not uh, uh, understanding exactly how the code works. We've seen this quite a bit where, uh, say, in an RX, um, RX Java application, you might map or flat map, or maybe you're just writing a Kotlin for each statement, and you don't realize that even though this is functional and it operates across a collection, it's going to do everything sequentially and um, not in parallel. So uh, it's very difficult sometimes to imagine what's going on, and you really need a tool to uh, help you understand what's happening there. Scarlett, back to you. Before we move on to the next uh, code pattern, let's assess this impact on users and the effort required to identify it. Anastasia, on a scale of one to five, how significant do you believe this code pattern's impact on uh, user experience? Um, thanks, Scarlett. I would give it a solid four. And the reason for that is that on the one hand, this pattern, this uh, thing with things going into queue, the bottlenecks, um, it is unavoidable, like when you're designing things, it will still be happening. It's normal to happen. However, if you're actually able to take a look into where this bottleneck is happening, how much the delay is and what is causing it, with this, you can prioritize uh, each particular bottleneck, each particular queue, and there, understanding the level of significance of a particular one, it is almost always possible to completely resolve it and rearrange things to reduce the delay almost completely. So cool. that's Thank important. You. Thank you. Uh, and Brian, as an Android expert, on a scale of one to five, how challenging do you find it is to identify this code pattern? Yeah, I think this is particularly challenging because, you know, for one, like we said, they're unrecognized cues. Secondly, um, there can be some sort of randomness. It's not always, it doesn't always happen the same way. And finally, we're, we're already expecting a delay. And if the delay you know, it was a few hundred milliseconds longer, we might just attribute that to uh, something happening on the server or something outside of our control. So for that, I'm going to give it, oh, let's see if we can get it in focus. I'm going to give it a five. It's a difficult one to identify. Wow. So we got a four for user experience and five for like level of difficulty identifying these challenges. So be aware. Um, uh, but for that, back at you, Anastasia. Thank you both. Um, yeah, thanks, Scarlett. So the second pattern that we're going to address is actually very similar. And in some sense, it could be seen as a subcase of the previous one. And that is about main thread overwhelm. So this is some something that a lot of engineers are aware of and tracking it. And it concerns the case when, well, there is just a lot of stuff going on in main thread. Uh, and then uh, the... Um, a reason why it would affect users' experience is that um, a lot of things, especially related to the UI, can only be executed in the main thread, which includes rendering and showing each of the frames that you see on the screen. And in particular, in the cases when user experience is supposed to be smooth and you have some continuous process showing on the screen, such as scroll, animation, some smooth transition, when you want to see those frames uh, changing one another smoothly uh, and evenly. In this case, what happens is that um, the space for the queue that you can afford is getting shorter. So as an example, um, the, the more advanced our phones become, the more advanced technologies we get, the higher refresh rate both uh, phone companies and 
app developers the, the, the higher frame uh, rate you want to show. So now on the most modern Android phones, you can get frame rate as high as 120 hertz, which gives you a space between two consequent frames as little as between seven and eight milliseconds. And that's really tiny amount of time. And in this time, what you have to fit in is rendering of the next frame and any other processes, any other events that you want to execute in the main thread, which could be, you know, setting up some libraries, doing some other stuff. And uh, this, uh, because you need to fit in everything in this tiny amount of time, it kind of shifts lens from the way how we looked at the queues in the previous part and where you had this like big process final point and you were concerned about large delays, about larger queues. So when it gets to the main thread, even tiniest delays, even like as little delays as 10 milliseconds would already affect user experience as, and as you can see on the scroll example, it can cause a frame here and there to drop out cause jitter experience and it will be immediately noticed by the user, unlike in the other cases where 10 milliseconds delay is something neglectable. So with this, again, over to Brian for his engineering insights. Thanks, Anastasia. That super point about uh, the small amount of time, we usually look at 60 frames per second, which is about 16 milliseconds per, per frame. And like you're saying, 10 milliseconds is would uh, 10 milliseconds that doesn't need to be there is chewing up most of the time that you have uh, on a frame. Uh, one of the interesting points about um, frame rates is that you can't really just rely on Android to tell you uh, when you're dropping frames. Android only messages you in the log cat when you're um, dropping 30 frames or more, which is around, around half a second, uh, 480 milliseconds of delay. And uh, that would be very noticeable in just about any app any, in any circumstance. So it's really important to uh, pay attention to this yourself. And I thought there was a great um, example of a very popular Android library called Lottie. Um, and there was a post by Gabriel Peel recently that was associated with an update, the most recent update to the library. Lottie is an animation library. And there are two functions that it does. One is uh, it will draw the animation on the screen and then it will compute an update for the next frame. Uh, and the way that this was working prior to the up, to the most recent update is that the uh, update to the comp, you know the computations that did the update uh, were actually happening on the main thread prior to drawing, as demonstrated in the or uh, depicted in this diagram on the right. Uh, and and what happened was they moved the um, update step onto a, a worker thread, uh, and so you can see that down below in the slice. Uh, now we're drawing the frame based on the last uh, computations. And then immediately we can start doing the update while freeing up the main thread. And you can see that now there's there's uh, so much extra time on the main thread that other visual elements on in the UI can use to draw themselves or, or you know do whatever, inflate, do the layouts, all of those things that have to happen only on the main thread. So. Uh, furthermore, you can see that the update was actually quite a bit larger than the draw. So uh, it was a really inefficient way to do it. And even though it was more complicated and involved, you know, going into Java synchronization and locks and that sort of stuff, um, it's a huge improvement for uh, an animation library that's drawing very frequently on the screen. So back to you, Scarlett. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Great, and let's have another round of quick ratings. So Anastasia, on a scale of one to five, how do you think this code pattern impacts the user experience? Okay, this one, I'm gonna give it a little bit less. It's going to be three. And just because on the one hand, it, as I said, can be seen as a subcategory of the previous one. So it happens in some sense, a little bit less often. And because it covers, less of the user flows, less of the patterns of user experience, because a lot of important things in the app happen actually in like one update or in some discrete updates when you just see that one frame updates and you see the new layout and then the content appears in one frame. But wherever you see 
um, smooth updates, animations, scrolling, this kind of thing, especially scrolling with this like heavy on other stuff going on in the app, um, not just as animation. So that's a solid three and still very important to address because when it appears, it affects user experience significantly. Cool, thank you. And Brian, what about you? Uh, how challenging do you think it is to identify this cold pattern? Yeah, I'm gonna see if I get my paddle to show up here. I'm gonna give it a two. Um, I, I think, you know, for one, you have a visual cue uh, of, of when this is happening. It, it's happening on one thread, it's all on the main thread. The the real challenge, and it's it's also a thing that as, as engineers, we're uh, sort of trained that this is one of the more important um, things that we want to look out for as far as performance. The, the one trick is that you really have to be discerning about what, what are the things that have to happen on the main thread and what are things that we can uh, move off and kind of open your mind uh, like we saw in the blog post. Awesome. So it looks like this is a pretty low hanging fruit for us to uh, start paying attention to. Thank you both and back at you, Anastasia. Thanks, Scarlett. And with this, I'd like to uh, turn to the second part of our presentation, because as I mentioned, the patterns that we're going to talk about today, they're kind of split into two groups, and they're also like highly intersecting like the previous two. So we just discussed the case when the process that we're looking into um, is on itself designed well, like we're not looking into optimizing that process, but we are looking into how it interferes with the rest of things going on in the phone. And then now we're shifting the lens to the process itself and to how we can actually optimize execution or like whatever flow we're looking into. And here kind of the all next three categories, they would be concerning pretty much one pattern. And that is, again, as discussed previously, you have this amazing opportunity to schedule things to parallel threads, to execute stuff in the background, which is amazing. It allows you to shorten valuable users wait time. So now what we see often happening is that um, a very simple thing, just something that could be running in parallel with the rest of, uh, of the application, with the rest of the flow, um, is dispatched to a parallel thread later than it could be. And kind of like the general rule of thumb here is to dispatch things to parallel threads as early as possible to shorten users' wait time, to parallelize as many things as you can. However, even though it sounds simple in theory, it is almost impossible to achieve in reality because we don't ask ourselves this question, but like when writing every single line of code, oh, like, is it already time to dispatch something? Can I do this thing in parallel? You don't think about this constantly. So that is the reason why we kind of identified the three most common situations in which this dispatching happens too late. And some of them are intersecting, uh, but basically these are three cases in which like when writing this code, it's worth thinking already, like recognizing this point and thinking whether this is like the point when something should be already sent to a parallel thread. And also if you're trying to optimize the already existing code, please uh, take a look into these points. Those would be great kind of starting points to look for inefficiencies, to look for performance um, opportunities for optimization. And the first one is my personal favorite, uh, is the unnecessary UI dependencies. And that is something that surprised me the most at some point. Um, that concerns the case when um, a certain part of the app that runs in the parallel thread that's not visible to the user, very often that's loading of some content that's happening, like loading it from the server that's happening completely in parallel, would be dependent on a certain view update that often can be an animation, or like on this example, imagine you have an app and you're sending two network requests to fetch different kinds of data. Those requests can be interdependent. The second one needs data from the first one to start. So it's okay to send them in sequence, that's fine. But what we see often happening is that the first network request arrives, the data from it is parsed, it updates the UI, you probably rebuild the view model, you do some other stuff here, it takes time. Only then it will result in the UI update running in the main thread. 
And from there, your update, you will schedule the second network request, which itself will show some data on the screen. Now, what we see is that, uh, and what we recommend in these situations every time, is not to wait for the second network request for the UI update, to schedule it as early as possible once the data from the first request is parsed. And this way, you will be able to show data from this request, maybe just a few frames earlier, but maybe significantly earlier. It can actually save you sometimes seconds of wait time. And one last thing that I wanted to mention here is that the animation, uh, if the UI update that you're waiting for is the animation of in the beginning of page loading, that happens very often, and it can be considered as a product decision to do some smooth transition to do revealing of something. So very often these cases fall under the radar, and that is because um, one would be considered a product decision and just like design decision. But the second, the loading time would be only counted like for the network request for, for the actual loading time. And if these time segments do not intersect, you're actually running into the situation when you can count them separately and not realize that they both add up to the user's wait time and create this delay. And with this, for more details and his wonderful insight, I pass the floor to Brian. Thanks, Anastasia. That's a um, great description of the problem. And we also have an illustration with some real apps. Um, in the bottom left corner of the slide, uh, we have two apps for viewing stocks. And what you can see is that uh, we have taps on each screen. They both animate to, a next screen, to the next screen, but uh, the app on the left is much slower at displaying the data that is retrieved, while the app on the right um, is you know, the data is appearing much more quickly. And that is, is because the data in the second um, instance is being retrieved while we're transitioning to this new uh, piece of UI and uh, doing this animation. So, when, you know, one of the reasons that this happens is like a lot of times when you're learning how to do development um, uh, on a platform, iOS or Android, you're taught a certain way to do it. And that sort of sticks with you. It proliferates through a lot of examples. Um, and so you'll have uh, situations like this code that I have on the right, where you have, say, a list of stocks. And when you tap on a stock, you make a transition to a new activity or fragment. Um, and then once the fragment has animated onto the screen and inflated all of its views and done all the work that it needs to do, then you start to load the data. Well, it's very simple. Uh, it's not it's not totally simple. You may have to do some architectural changes uh, and and you know add some listeners and that sort of thing. But you can move actually move the couple of lines of code in this example uh, at the very bottom of the screen that uh, have a client new call. We can move that up into the um, into the button uh, click listener or click uh, yeah click listener above and just start the network request as soon as the tap occurs. And that's going to make, you know, the animation becomes more delightful because you get to watch the animation. And as soon as the animation is over, instead of waiting, your data is appearing. So back to you, Scarlett. Awesome. Well, as you all expected, let's dive into the round three of quick ratings. So Anastasia, on a scale of one to five, how significant do you think that this impacts user experience? Yeah, to me, that is uh, a solid five. And the reason for that is, well, I mentioned that it's my personal favorite, but also the reason for that is that this uh, pattern affects user experience regardless of how fast your phone is. If you're putting this dependency, you're creating a visually noticeable delay that could be avoided or shortened significantly, and you're um, putting your user in the situation when they will definitely experience it, like in the example that Brian just showed. So that's a five to me. And what about you, Ryan? Uh, how challenging do you think it is to identify this? Um, I think that it's, uh, uh, you have the visual cue, kind of know where to look, but it's it's a matter of like changing your perspective, changing your point of view to find them. Awesome. Well, sounds like this is something, again, we should pay attention to because it has a really high user impact, but not too challenging to identify. And with that, back at you, Anastasia. Uh, thanks, Scarlett, and I promise to go faster with the next categories. So here, the fourth pattern is highly intersecting with the previous one. Even the examples that we showed kind of were on the intersection of these two, and those are about network requests being scheduled too late. So the reason for identifying it as a separate 
pattern is that network requests usually take, in most of the apps, when you're fetching something from the server, network requests will take the most of the user's wait time. So pretty much anything that you can do around rescheduling them and around running them in parallel would save you that uh, time and often like that is the most significant optimization that you can do on your phone so um often it happens then when you're dispatching a network request to actually run to the server um you're making a choice of, of when to schedule it and the idea is that as early as you can do it you should be doing it uh, but what happens Often is that you're waiting for either a UI update, as in the previous example, but also there could be other stuff. Many examples come around the app start, and Brian will talk about it in a bit. So anytime when you are scheduling a significant network request that your user will be waiting for, just give it a second thought and ask yourself whether it could actually, whether you had enough data, whether you had everything set up to start it earlier, like in the example here. Brian, over to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so one of the interesting things about looking at traces around app starts, which obviously very important to, to everyone, first thing the user sees, uh, is that we start seeing these really long app, app starts where all kinds of work is, is being done. And what we discovered is that it's very common. We're using a lot of libraries and apps this year, these days. It could be you know analytics libraries or some kind of authentication or maybe crash reporting all these different things that tell you, hey, you know, do this initialization in your app on create. Um, and, and that's fine, but uh, sometimes you can wait and do these things later. You want to offload uh, what's happening at App Startup. You can get to a screen more quickly. Maybe you, if you have something like a network request, you can kick that off in the service or something like that um, before you start loading all of these other libraries that you're going to be using later. And then a final and very interesting uh, aspect is we've noticed that dependency injection can be impactful here because dependency injection will inflate an object graph, which is notoriously um, time consuming to build a bunch of objects. Uh, and if you don't have proper scoping on your dependency injection, you might be loading things at an application start that could be done later in an activity or maybe not even done at all if you never reach uh, the part of a user flow that needs that particular um, set of objects. Back to you, Scarlett. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so let's keep the momentum going with round four quick rating. So Anastasia, on a scale of one to five, how challenging do you think it is to identify this code pattern? I think you're asking me about the impact on the user experience. And yeah, sorry. with this, I'll vote it for as three, because again, as mentioned, highly intersecting with the previous category. And those cases that are not dependent on the UI changes, I would say they appear a bit less often and usually not that time significant there would be like less functions holding you back so that's going to be a three but still still very often and very noticeable brian what about how difficult is it to find it in the code yeah absolutely so for this i give it a four um i think the situation here is i mean you you know what's happening you you have some visual cues but uh it's a matter of this is just how we do it and to figure out what can be loaded when you really need to dig into the code and and do uh, uh you know serious analysis of of when you actually need you know objects uh to be available um uh, okay and with this let's jump to the uh next pattern and that is also related to network requests and the reason for that is Again, as I said, because network requests are eating up most of the user's wait time in most of the uh, processes in your app, in most of the page loading scenarios, you like you need to fetch data from the server. So the case that we see pretty often, I would say less often than late scheduling, but still very often is when the network requests that could be running in parallel are executed sequentially. And um, 
there can be multiple reasons for them. Sometimes it goes unrecognized that requests are in fact independent. So um, kind of the question to ask yourself here would be if you can, um, if you have a sequence of network requests in your load-in pattern, to ask yourself whether they actually, whether the second one or the third one needs the data from the previous one to run, or if you have enough to schedule them in parallel, or if you can like separate them in such a way that they can be scheduled in parallel. And the reason why we always recommend doing it and why we find this so significant is that, well, often, as Brian mentioned, those patterns go unrecognized because they are thought to be issues on the backend side and they require a lot of resources to be fixed. But it turns out that a lot of network optimization can actually be done on the front end side. And if on the backend, back end, you will be uh, fighting for just a few percent, maybe 10% of optimization would be already great. Here, if you put two requests that were running in sequence in parallel, you can easily uh, save something like between 30 to 50% of the wait time. Realistically, what will happen, yeah, you'll take the shortest of those network requests and you will cut its length completely by 100%. So this is very um, cheap improvement in this sense, but it gives you extreme uh, gain in sense of time that is saved. And with this, uh, Brian, over to you for your insights. Yeah, thank you, Anastasia. Um, the, one of the main pushbacks we get on this is, is an argument about uh, bandwidth. And it's true that this is a latency versus bandwidth trade-off. There's some uh, you know, overhead associated with doing a bunch of network requests and making too many can impact the amount of time it takes previous uh, network requests to complete. I would just say this is a place you want to do testing. And what we found is that unless you're doing something that's very bandwidth heavy, like streaming video or doing downloads, you can almost always see significant improvement by parallelizing network requests um, whenever uh, they're available to you. Usually the problem here isn't recognizing so much as, uh, you know, making sure that you have all the information uh, available to parallelize. Back to you, Scarlett. Awesome. And let's keep the momentum going. Uh, and we are on a roll. So Anastasia, on a scale of one to five, how significant uh, it is <clears throat> the impact on user experience? Um, I'd give it a four because even though it's not the most common thing to happen, the improvement that can be achieved here, as I said, often is between 30 and 50% of total wait time. If you can do this, go for it. This would affect user experience extremely. Thank you. And Brian, how challenging uh, do you find it is to identify this co-patent? Yeah, I think this is a, for me, this is a three. I think a lot of times we know when we're running network requests um, in, in, in sequence instead of parallel, but it, it, it's a matter of, again, analyzing the code and figuring out, you know, how to arrange things so that we have everything that we need to parallelize. And again, testing to make sure that it improves our performance. Awesome. So it sounds like it, uh, again, this is a great opportunity for us to look out for because it's high user impact, but um, medium challenging to identify. And with that, back at you, Anastasia. Yay. And here we come to our bonus category. And let me say a few words why we introduced it. And mainly that is because the previous ones were highly intersecting. They, they were very related. Some of them had a lot of cases that fall into two categories at the same time. So, and they, the previous two big categories they concerned are the interference between processes and how like multi-threading is used maybe even efficiently, but then processes interfere and create a queue or how you're not dispatching things to the parallel thread. Um, on time, but then there is kind of another big chunk of issues that could happen with the performance that comes from the um, trade-offs that you make and often from to when you're shipping features fast and you just like need to make things work and you don't care at that moment that much about everything working as efficient as it could be, which is completely understandable. Yeah, we all do this from time to time. The thing that we notice that this kind of legacy issues, they tend to stay in the code way longer than anybody could expect them. They stay there in smaller apps that just 
launched, but they also appear to happen in like the huge apps with ton of legacy code. And among those like legacy issues, among those uh, quick fixes, the one that we find to happen the most often and that surprised us maybe one of the most is the hard-coded delay. And the issue with hard-coded delays are that, okay, they can be used maybe to avoid some of the more complex logic, like in this example, if you cannot, um, if it's hard to check when like a certain event finished to schedule the second one, you would just introduce a hard-coded delay, which is, uh, again, fine on its own in some cases, but then what happens to your users is that by this hard coded delay, you actually need to estimate how long it will take to uh, for this other unrelated, well, related events to finish, but maybe you cannot like quickly check when they finish. So you need to estimate when it will, how long it will take on the lowest end devices, on the slowest phones on the market, because this hard coded delay should work for all of your users. This way, what you're doing is that you're modeling the slowest phones behavior on the fastest phones that your users have. So you are basically making all of your users experience the worst possible scenario here. So that said, uh, we always recommend reducing these delays. Um, and with, with this, I pass a uh, stage to Brian for, well, his stories and insights. Uh, thanks, Anastasia. This, this is one of my favorite ones because when I, uh, when I saw that we were seeing these hard-coded delays in multiple apps, it made me think of an old joke about a group of programmers who, whenever management asked them to per, uh, improve performance, they had they would just go to a hard coded delay that they had put into the code, reduce it by a few percent, and immediately improve performance. It's a fix all uh, for any performance problems. And again, uh, you know their facilities now encode like async await uh, patterns that can help um, make up for missing callbacks or other facilities and libraries, so that you can really avoid use you know trying to use a hack of a hard coded delay um, to fix kind of problems. Back to you, Scarlett. I know it's sad, but here we go. It's the final round of our quick rating. So Anastasia, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate the impact of this cold pattern? Yeah, I'll give it a three this time. And uh, the reason for that would be that it's not super common. It doesn't appear all the time. It's actually kind of hidden to, well, often where you don't expect it to see, but then this is something that we see in a lot of apps. And it's just so persistent, this delay, that, well, it stays there. So we recommend taking a look into it. And again, it makes uh, fastest phones behave like the slowest ones. So definitely something worth targeting. And Brian, what do you think of um, the level of difficulty for this code pattern? I'm going to go with two. Um, I think, you know, we usually know that they're there. Uh, in fact, a lot of times they're round numbers. So you're like, why is it always 500 milliseconds? Uh, so you, they can be pretty easy to find. The bigger thing is, you know, it's probably been there for years in the code base and four new developers have moved through the position and you have no idea why or if it's even safe to change. Awesome. Well, and with that, that's a wrap for today's webinar. And here's a table for your reference uh, to better understand how easy it is uh, to identify these patterns and how it impacts the user so that you can know better how to prioritize um, these code patterns in the future. Um, I know we're already at time. Uh, we're happy to stay behind for a little bit to answer any questions you have. Or if not, uh, feel free to just drop us a like a DM or connect with us on LinkedIn and we'll be more than happy to follow up with you. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, uh, Anastasia or Brian, find LinkedIn or our team, contact our team directly at hi pro at productscience.ai for any questions regarding product science overall, the product specifically, or if you pay attention in the beginning uh, of the introduction, you notice some fun fact about Anastasia and Brian and myself that I didn't cover. For example, um, Anastasia is scared of butterfly. Brian is living with crocodile. And the fun fact about me, if you want to learn more about it, please connect me with me online and I might consider sharing with you if you're willing to do that.